during these Sunday mornings in the season of Lent, we are going to be talking about assumptions in our life and in our faith that need to be challenged. And this morning we're talking about assuming the best of baptism. It is always the fine print, isn't it? Whether it's an insurance policy or a warranty or a product description, it is always the fine print that gets you. Uh, there is, oh, coupons too. Yeah, there's a company here in town, in fact, it's a nationwide company, they send me a 15% off coupon every week. Every week I get a 15% off your purchase coupon via my phone. So I decided to go to the brick and mortar store here in town a couple of months ago. I took an item to the counter, laid it on the counter. The clerk looked at me and said, well, the coupon is not valid for this brand. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, if you flip the coupon over, there's a listing of all the brands that the coupon is not valid for. And we flipped it over, and he gave me a magnifying glass. And <laughs> literally on the back of this coupon were listed every brand that was in the store. Have you seen these coupons? I, I promise you it was every brand in the store. I finally looked at him and said, what could I use this coupon for? I want you to go and get something in the store that I can get 15% off for. He looked at me and he gave me 15% off of my item. <laughs> it's the fine print. Uh, baptism was certainly a high point in Jesus' life. It was that moment that Jesus connected with the ministry of John the Baptist. It was that moment that Jesus identified with humanity, got in line, and was baptized with the other people of Judea. It was that moment where Jesus had his first deep spiritual experience recorded in Scripture, where the heavens opened above him and the Spirit of God descended upon him, and he actually heard the voice of God say to him that you are my beloved. There are a lot of great things about baptism. And for Trinity and Laurie this morning, this is, this is a day of baptism for you. It's one of those great days of life. When you sense the affirmation of God, you have someone say to you in sermon or otherwise, you are God's beloved in whom God is well pleased. It's when you see a congregation look at you and affirm the faith that you have stepped into and expressed. The moment of our baptism is a wonderful moment. And we assume the best of baptism, that it's the beginning of a wonderful life with God and in the church and a moment that's going to frame our life for moving into the world. But I feel it's my duty and my obligation and only right that I tell you about the fine print, particularly for Trinity and Laurie this morning, but for all of us who have been baptized that haven't flipped the coupon over. Most sermons on Jesus' baptism end with Jesus coming up out of the water and the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and he hears this voice of spoken affirmation by God. But oftentimes we don't read the next verse to catch the fine print. So in verse 12 it said, And when Jesus had come up out of the water, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness for 40 days, and he was tempted by Satan there and had to live among the wild beasts. Trinity and Laurie, you are headed for the wilderness. Sorry, it's the fine print. We should have told you ahead of time. And what happens in this wilderness? What happens after our baptism? It is after our baptism that we start to struggle with some things in the wilderness of life. And one of the things we struggle with is what kind of Christian will I be? In baptism, we say, I am a Christian. I am a follower of Christ now. But after baptism, the question becomes, what kind of Christian will I be? It was true for Jesus. And so we get the details in Matthew and Luke's gospel. When Jesus goes into the wilderness, he's tempted to turn these stones into bread and be a Messiah that feeds people or jump off the temple pinnacle and be a Messiah that amazes and impresses people or bow down before me and I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. You can be a Messiah that politically controls people. And Jesus had to decide over 40 days in the wilderness after his baptism, what kind of Messiah am I going to be? Trinity and Laurie, you have been baptized, and at the beginning of 40 days of Lent, that's our 40 days in the liturgical wilderness, it's not a bad time for you to ask, or for all of us to ask, so what kind of Christian will we be? 
We all know that there are many kinds of Christians in the world. I don't know if you knew that. Did you know that there are 80 different Baptist organizations just in the United States? 80 different kinds of Baptists. There are 300 major Christian traditions worldwide with 33,000 Christian divisions of these major religions in 238 countries. And I'm not even talking about that. Those aren't the kind of identities that I'm talking about, not divisions and denominations. I'm just talking about what type of Christian will we be? You know them. Some Christians are so rigid, they are cruel. And some Christians are so positive, they have absolutely no challenge in their life. Some are so defined and judgmental that they are exclusive, and some are so lacking in Christian distinctiveness that they might as well be members of civic clubs or social service agencies or recreation centers. What type of Christian will we be? I get a lot of phone calls. You know this. And typically it's because of the type of Christian I've chosen to be. Uh, I did a little show in several cities called Stories I Can't Tell in Church. This story I can tell. I shared it as a part of that little show. I had a gentleman call me one day and wanted me to explain to him how I justify being 100% inclusive in my faith and in the church, and he wanted me to justify it biblically. Now, usually I don't go into all of that on the telephone, but this person seemed to have a genuine desire to know. And so I took him through the book of Leviticus and took him through the life of Jesus and took him through the writings of Paul and took him through the book of Acts to talk about how God's spirit has been pursuing us and becoming more and more and more expansive throughout the history of faith. After I finished, he said to me, that is a credible argument. And then he said, but my pastor says some people don't belong in the faith. And he makes a credible argument too and I'm gonna to have to stick with my pastor. So I stopped him before he hung up and I said, you asked me a question and I answered it, can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, if both arguments are credible, if both arguments are credible, and one leads to love and acceptance and grace and the other leads to judgment and cruelty and exclusion, why not choose the path of love? What kind of Christian are you going to be? The fine print of the wilderness asks us what kind of Christian we will be. It also asks us what kind of church member we will be. Baptism was Jesus' union and identification with the people of faith, people who identified with John's message. This was not a solitary act. This was not an act of personal piety on Jesus' part. He was baptized into a community and faith family. And when we are baptized, we join a faith family, a community. Have you ever noticed how the early days of family are always perfect? Yeah, just mull on that for a little bit. I often get to be at the hospital soon after a baby is born and inevitably, inevitably the parents are just glowing with joy and they look at me and they say things like, isn't she perfect? She's just perfect, isn't she? Isn't she perfect? Look at her, Jim. Isn't she just perfect? And I often want to call three days later at about two o'clock in the morning. Say, hey, how's Miss Perfect doing over there? Has it been going okay? Yeah, my daughter brought him home to meet me. Dad, he's just perfect. I love calling years later and going, hey, how's Mr. Perfect doing over there? My sister brought her boyfriend home one time. He was sitting at our supper table, and he looked at all of us, and he said, this is just the perfect family. I kind of said to him, as a high schooler would say, you hadn't been to Thanksgiving or family reunion yet. Yeah. You hadn't met Uncle Walter yet. Trinity and Laurie and everybody else sitting here, things may feel a little more perfect today, going through baptismal waters and dedicating babies, but we aren't going to be a perfect faith family. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to do things we shouldn't and say things we shouldn't, and we're not going to say some things we should or do some things that we should. But we learn to be graceful and merciful and patient and loving with each other. Th this is what Jesus lived out for us. Jesus' closest friends in the community of faith denied him and betrayed him and deserted him. But in the end, he remained faithful to them and they found a way to remain faithful to him and to each other. 
The fine print is what kind of church member and faith community person will we be? And what kind of witness will we be in the world? And Jesus left that region and went into the region of Galilee to speak the good news. You know the Greek word for witness is martyrus. It's the exact same word as martyr. What kind of witness will we be in the world? It, it makes sense then why Jesus says, if you want to follow me, if you want to be my disciple and be my witness in the world, you have to deny yourself and take up a cross and follow me because to be a witness in the world means to be a martyr, to lose some sense of yourself and your life. See, here's the deal when it comes to Jesus. Jesus was poor and gentle and compassionate he hungered for and thirsted for and spoke for righteousness. He was merciful and pure and a peacemaker, and yet he was not welcome in the world or the temple. He was a threat to the established order. He was a constant irritation to those who considered themselves rulers of the world. He was crucified for speaking the truth and loving too much. What kind of witness will you be in the world? I think, or at least it's been my experience, that the more you try to be like Jesus, the more often you befriend Samaritans and tax collectors, speak truth to Pharisees, touch lepers, elevate the status of the poor and women and others who have been pressed down, the less likely you will be liked by the rulers of the world or the keepers of Southern religious culture or sometimes even the church. Witness, martyrs, martyrs. My time's up. If you would like to become a follower of Christ today and would like to be baptized into this church, if you'd like to become a member of First Baptist, it's a great decision to make. You'll get a sense of God's affirmation. You'll be connected to a wonderful faith family. Just don't flip the coupon over and read the fine print, okay? Just kidding. Read the fine print, because it's the fine print that always gets you. Let's pray together. Loving God, we thank you today that you call us, lean on us, depend on us to be your hands and your feet and your heart in this world. We have been baptized into a great and glorious purpose. Bless us today as we open our hearts, open the church doors, open this space for others who might come and join us on the journey. And it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.